covered three statistics there, Glassdoor and Gallup. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of more statistics before we launch into some of the practical tips. So I'm going to take some statistics from the Deloitte uh, study that was actually published about two months ago. And it's saying 43% of millennials envisage leaving their job within two years and 28% are looking to stay beyond five years. This is quite a startling statistic because you're talking, you know, more than half of, um, of the percentage here. Recently hired employees are also jumping ship. We've seen a lot of traction on this too recently. So reasons for leaving were a poor onboarding experience, a lack of clarity surrounding the job duties and expectations, or a less than stellar boss. So this seems to be the quick and um, common denominator across all organizations about the whole manager or boss situation. There's a lot of people joining organizations and leaving within six months, especially in the millennial category. So we need to make sure that we're isolating this particular retention issue, because that is obviously, uh, you know, implicit that there's much more going on inside of the organization. Boomerang employees, this concept of boomerang employees has been around the last four or five years and in the recent Deloitte 2018 um, article it said 49% of millennials say they will actually return to a former employer. Now this is good because we're talking about key talent here, not everyone who leaves the organization, you'd like them to come back of course, but we're talking of your key talent. And there's a lot to be said for Boomerang employees returning back because they can hit the ground running. And many large organizations globally are creating a Boomerang rehire policy um, for these employees that are leaving because they might leave for a year or two, gain experience elsewhere and come back into the organization. So it's something that we need to look at as part of any retention policy and talent management policy is what are we doing with Boomerang employees? Now, this is obviously only relevant to larger type entities, in particular those with a global focus. The gig economy is a very, very large issue. And just to explain what the gig economy is, it's kind of come up to play for the last couple of years. And with this gig economy, it's about the casualization of work, especially across Generation Z and millennial generations. So what this is in reality is people accepting small contract work on a needs basis, they go off and then travel for a while, come back, take another piece of work and so forth. And it's that rise of this entrepreneurial culture that's happening more so in this Generation Z, which is people born after 1995. So we need to look and say, is this gig economy an actual issue for attention? And are organizations like ourselves competing with this gig economy? And in the recent Deloitte survey, they said 62% of millennials who would willingly leave their employers within the next two years actually regard the gig economy as a viable alternative to full-time employment. That's quite startling to see that they see that as an, as an actual option. Now, in some cases, this isn't relevant to older generations like myself, Generation X and so forth, because obviously with commitments like childcare and mortgages and things like that, we can't just jump ship and take some casual work arrangements where it suits us. However, the millennials and Generation Z represent a huge workforce um, percentage in our organizations are also our future talent leadership pipeline. So this is obviously extremely important that we're keeping tabs on this gig generation um, and gig economy to see, are we factoring this into our attention? And are we actually ensuring that our employees don't see this as a complete alternative to full-time work within our organizations? So it's important to keep tabs on this. So I wanted to share, as I said, a couple of statistics and apologies if you've missed the first one or two. We'll make sure that the slides are sent across to you. So we're going to launch straight into the 10 top tips to retain the key talent. And tip number one, again, you may be focusing on this already, but I want to refresh and, and highlight how important this one is. Focusing on your employer branding and your candidate experience. And by employer branding, I mean internal employer branding and also external employer branding. The external brand is all about how you're actually recruiting externally, how much social media, how much positive news stories, success stories, all that stuff that you're actually keeping very much alive in the digital era. And then your internal brand image, which really promotes your external brand image, which is all about your retention, engagement and productivity and your internal success stories. With a candidate experience, a lot of organizations now are doing peer interviewing or peer to peer interviewing. So employees are getting a snapshot of what it's like to work with the people that would be working directly with an organization. And also um, they're getting to see in reality how the job would be from a day to day basis. That's really driving candidate experience in many organizations because they're getting a snapshot of, of the reality of the job. All it takes is one bad interview 
to promote a really negative candidate experience. And unfortunately, in the digital era that we live in, it gets promoted around the place quite quickly um, in terms of a negative candidate experience. And people like, you know, like hotel stays and trip advisor reviews, people will always um, talk about the negative experience rather than the positive experience. So really focusing on employer branding, making sure we have some sort of um, policy on employer branding and promoting that candidate experience because it all feeds into retention. The second one I'd like to focus on is setting expectations. It, one of the first um, bullet points that we covered on this uh, webinar at the start was about people not having their expectations met and that's one of the reasons they would leave quite early on into the process of joining. So it's expectation versus reality. And a recent Glassdoor survey said more than two thirds, which is 67% of employers believe retention rates would be higher if candidates had a clear picture of what to expect about working at the company before taking the job. A lot of people are, as they say, to quote, you know, given the sun, moon and stars of the interview, but then they start and they see a fundamental difference from what was told would be about the job to what actually materializes in reality. So really setting expectations and not promising future promotions and interviews when that's not necessarily going to be the case upon arriving. So the first two points are quite linked uh, closely together. The third point that I'd like to point out is providing excellent managers. This is something very close to my heart because I spend a lot of my time in organizations coaching people who are having difficulties with their managers. To go back to the first quote about Gallup, one in two people have left and continue to leave a job throughout their career down to the manager. We're still unfortunately promoting people because they're technically very good even though they don't have the people skills to be managers. So we need to really really focus on manager training, making sure that the right managers are the right fit with the employees and really providing not good managers, but excellent managers, because these are the face of the organization. These are the people that will be in touch with your employees on a day to day basis and will therefore be promoting retention every single day. If you have a manager that's going around with a negative attitude or a negative mindset, it's filtering down to so many employees. And if a bad manager has a bad day, your employees have a bad day. So really focus on providing excellent managers across the board. Coaching and mentoring, this has been around for years, but there's been a huge resurgence of coaching and mentoring in the last 18 months. Um, and I am always of the advocate, my personal view is to have a coach from an external person coming into the organization because you need that independent uh, bird's eye view that the individual can take. And mentoring, a lot of organizations have now, and again, the last 18 months provided um, a formal mentoring program, not this ad hoc mentoring where people can have a cup of coffee with some sort of executive sponsor or champion across the business, but formal mentoring where your mentors are actually given a half day training, your mentees are given a half day training, and there's appropriate competency matching set up that their mentoring is actually tailored into their career development plan and succession plan as well. This can give each individual employee a much greater platform, especially if there's not a promotion pending or there's not an immediate career step for them. So the coaching and mentoring alongside further education opportunities is a great thing for attention. From, from people that I'm out talking with on a regular basis in regards to coaching and mentoring, they're finding huge advantage from that, um, especially being matched up with someone who has been in the organization quite some time and can really tell them how to navigate the political side and the relationship side from that. So don't overlook coaching and mentoring. It doesn't have to be very expensive if you have budget constraints. It can be done really, really cost effectively, but the benefits can be huge. Number five, this is all about tailoring engagement and winning hearts and minds. From a personality perspective, we're wired either two ways. We, we go by the heart or we go by the head, and some of us sit in the middle. But when you're looking at engagement initiatives and motivating initiatives, we have to remember that some people are led by the heart and some people are led by the mind. And a Gallup recent statistic shows us that 15% of employees worldwide are engaged in their jobs. That statistic scares me because that's so incredibly low when we're talking about engagement. 
And, you know, from HR professionals, you'll know engagement is around a very long time, but it has to have this renewed vigor of how we look at it in, in combination with all the other points that we're talking about today. So we need to tailor it. That carrot and stick approach is now gone. It's all about that engagement piece. It's all about having that autonomy, mastery and purpose within your organization and winning those hearts and minds every single day and having those excellent managers winning those hearts and minds every single day. It's also about making sure we're promoting this concept of growth mindset in our organizations. And the growth mindset is all about making sure we're allowing people to take risks in their job. We're allowing people the autonomy and that we're rewarding these risks and not just necessarily the outcome. That we're not in this kind of stable, fixed mindset in our organizations that we're really about promoting opportunity and growth. Number six, promote flexible working arrangements. Now this is again around this concept for the last 10 years, but there's still many organizations that haven't adopted their approaches in line with this. This gig economy that we spoke about already at the start, um, one of the reasons people are wanting to kind of move into the gig economy and this kind of flexible contracting work and not be part of an organization is down to the way they work. People, you know, don't want to do this nine to five and most organizations have adapted this, but are, what are we doing that's better than other organizations? How are we staying ahead of the curve on this flexible type working pattern? And, you know, we're talking about self-balance, not just work-life balance, but a lot of the time people think people are working long hours, they're working, you know, maybe nine to eight in organizations, not because they're in the office, but in their head, they can be taking work home in their head and they're not having sleepless nights over big things and work and things like that. That's also work-life balance too. A recent Hayes 2018 survey said that 33% of employees said flexible working options were critical to their remaining in their employment. So this is a really important one for uh, employees in situ and retention. So what are we doing? Virtual working, remote working, most organizations have finally adapted to this. So organizations who haven't yet have some sort of remote working, even a one day, from, uh, one day a week from home kind of policy or some sort of virtual working, really need to start focusing on this because most organizations have adapted this at this stage. Career breaks are now prevalent across the private sector. Five, six years ago, this was unheard of. In the public sector and universities, things like that, it was quite common, but in the private sector, it wasn't. Now most organizations are looking at it because if they don't look at it, they're probably gonna lose the employee anyway. So what are we doing around that? Number seven, listen and listen more. I'm sorry about the graphic of uh, somebody crawling into the ear here, but it's just to grab your attention on this. The amount of times I'm out in organizations and someone says to me, my boss just does not listen to me. It's, it's everywhere. We really have to focus on listening and listening again. We're so busy and so frantic in our day-to-day -day lives and work that we do this su you know, superficial level of listening where we're, we're kind of half listening to somebody and we're acknowledging them, but we're really not listening to what's going on with our employees. So I'd really ask managers and everyone to focus and listen and listen some more and challenge ourselves. Number eight, internal talent spotting and career growth. Um, I'm challenging organizations to go outside of your normal talent management process, your normal succession career growth plans, your normal performance management calibration sessions. Most organizations have adapted this concept of promoting hackathons. Now, when I say hackathon, I'm not talking about hacking anything. A hackathon and, and Microsoft as a company is one of the kind of prevalent organizations in this space organizes annual hackathons. And what these are is where you dedicate two or three days a year, uh, or in some days twice a year, to promoting idea generation, brainstorming, and things like that. So you get your employees into a room and you give them free reign to come up with the best ideas for organizations. And sometimes you'll find you get employees completely coming out of the woodwork with these initiatives that wouldn't necessarily be normally on your talent management map or your succession map. And these have proven to be really, really um, beneficial in organizations. And it's highlighting those employees that wouldn't normally um, be, be spoken. So you can see I have my Where's Wally picture here um, because that's what it's like. It's actually extrapolating out this key talent and really looking for that talent in places that you might not normally look for. Point number nine, analyzing levers data and having a proper offboarding process. Um, there's a hard, huge focus on onboarding and recruitment, but very little on offboarding because when people are leaving, a lot of organizations don't at the time or you know, won't invest in a proper offboarding process. So some shocking statistics here again, 
74% of exi exiting employees believe companies won't take action on their feedback. And that's from Tallyvest 2018. A third party exit interview increases response rates by 40% and honesty improves by 63% with reasons for leaving. So the fact that is that they'll actually probably share much more with an independent person. Now this kind of stuff isn't new. This has been around for quite some time, but recent surveys are saying that we need to start focusing on this leavers data. I'm working with some very large organizations at the moment and they've always had, you know, exit interviews, kind of more ad hoc piecemeal, um, but never really focused in on actually cleaning that data, analyzing that data and actually turning some action plans into place to go, okay, we really need to focus on this reason for people leaving. So I think we need to put a whole renewed focus on this in line with our retention policy in terms of how we analyze people and how we are going to work on that data afterwards. And the last point, but certainly not least in my mind, is be unique in your offering. Don't be afraid of being different. Be afraid of being the same as everybody else, because if you are the same as everybody else, there's no difference in attraction in, in, uh, from a candidate experience. Be unique in your offering. Think outside the box and not mimic what other organizations are doing, because there's some really, really inventive initiatives that we can look at around this space that other organizations aren't talking about. There's a lot of being, being written about on this space at the moment, especially in the States. So I'd encourage you to follow uh, groups around retention and you, you know, unique talent and um, management offerings in this space, because I think there's a lot to be learned and there's a lot yet to be uncovered in terms of how we actually look at this space in general. So um, I'm going to just check the chat box to see if there's any specific questions that we have around this. And again, apologies for uh, the shaky start with the technology. We'll make sure that we share the slides uh, across to everyone so you can see the points that you missed in advance. Great. Mm, Fiona, while you're doing that, <clears throat> I might just make an observation and just one question while you're looking to see if there's questions that come through from chat. Um, tip seven I, I liked, and I often think of um, a quote I was given for that, which was, we're given two ears and one mouth. And if we use them in proportion, we'd probably be in much less trouble, as in if we listen to as much as we spoke. Um, can I ask you just if you had an example of a company you think you do it particularly well, and or if there was one thing that people should do today, as in if there was one action that they should do um, today to retain key talents, what would you suggest? Okay, so in response to those two questions, Owen, I think, you know, Microsoft, I've mentioned Microsoft already. I'm not particularly working with Microsoft or anything, but I've read an awful lot about what they do around this talent spotting and hackathons and things like that. So I think they're, they're doing ver, you know, really, really well in this space. If there's one thing that we had to do, I would say it's down to your managers. Um, it's down to making sure that those managers are bringing it every day. Um, it goes back to the very first quote about that Forbes thing. We need to make sure that every single day that we are making sure that people are being re-recruited on a daily basis from that energy perspective. The biggest thing that I've seen in, in, in my whole career is it comes down to the managers because I said one and two um, is a key thing. There's another question just after coming in that I'm going to read out. And the question is, in your opinion, how important are employee benefit packages, private health cover, dental, etc., in retaining and attracting talent. So in response to that, I, I firstly think it depends on the level that the employee is at. Um, I'm going to call it out. It actually depends on the age of the person is and their life um, status as well, because certain things will be important at certain stages in your life. But recent statistics show this is still really important. And what I'll do in response to this question is put a couple of more statistics around this into the deck that we shared today, because I haven't specifically covered package um, because I think it's a given, but I'll certainly put those statistics in. So I think, yes, it is important, um, you know, health cover and dental. However, the other stuff is just as important. I don't think the benefits package should be neglected because salary, and I think off the top of my head, over 45% um, you know, salary is still important and there's still benchmark against salary. But to give some context, I'm coaching this one individual lady at the moment. She's 28, real high flyer, star performer. And she's got two packages on, on, on her plate to choose from in terms of job offers. Uh, she's 28 years of age and one package offers 10,000 euro more on the base, which is significant at that level. And she's actually accepting the other one because she met the manager, she really liked the manager, um, and she really liked the, the culture of the organization, the initiatives, the flexible work arrangements. So that lady in particular has actually put a lot more effort into that side of it than the actual salary. 
Um, now that's just not everyone, that's just an example, but I do think it's important. Great, I think Rose has a, a question there about one slide mentioning 50% of staff engagement. And yeah. she wants to know, does that mean 85% are not engaged? Well, it's like any statistic, isn't it? You can take what you want from it. Um, that's what the Gallup uh, Worldwide Survey has come out and said that 15% are not um, or 15% are engaged, you have to kind of go back and question what is engagement um, in, in terms of that. So it's like, you know, with, with any statistic, you can take what you want from it. I don't necessarily mean that 85% are not exactly engaged. I think there's a lot more to engagement than we see. I know that sounds like a wishy-washy answer, but... Now we have one more question in. What's your opinion on 360 degree reviews and how often do you believe reviews should be performed? Can you recommend a good review template? Sure. So I'm, I'm a fan of 360 degree uh, reviews only if it's done in the proper way and the culture supports it because I've seen 360 degree reviews done in quite of a negative cultural climate and it can backfire on you. So I think if they're governed right, they're communicated in the right fashion, they can be really, really powerful, um, especially to the managers you always have to balance, are you going to do anonymous or not? Because if somebody's managing a big team, you might want to do anonymous. Again, I think you need to do it um, not anonymous because I think that it is what it is. People need to have that voice so they can vocalize what's going on. In terms of a good review template, to be honest with you, a lot of organizations use their own templates. They use their own systems. Um, like big HR systems that they have, you can actually customize templates from that. And that's what a lot of organizations use. Right, we have one more question from Ivan, yeah. if that's okay. Um, do you think effective coaching and mentoring can offset less than excellent management in the short term? I like this question because I was doing something on this yesterday. Um, I think um, it, it can not necessarily offset, it can help. But once you have a bad manager, you have a bad manager, right? Let's say that, and that has to be fixed. But if you're providing coaching, what we can do is you can actually learn to manage your manager. And that's what a lot of organizations have had to try to deploy if they can't, you know, all of a sudden take a manager out of a role. So I, I've been encouraging people to manage your manager. And often it can be some sort of personality clash that you're working quite differently with your manager because maybe one of you might be more introverted. They might be more extroverted or more structured and things like that. So there's ways that you can actually coach an employee to manage their manager in the interim. So, yeah, I think I think that's a fair point. And there's two questions, one from Sean and Emer. Do you have enough time for two more questions? I do, yes, of course, yeah. So Sean was asking, how big a role do you think that true coaching is playing in organizations versus those that think they are coaching? Okay, so how big a role do you think that true coaching is playing in organizations? Yeah, coaching in some organizations has been given a bit of a bad reputation because it's deployed in an incorrect manner. Um, some people do a one-day coaching course and, and believe they're coaches and they go off and unfortunately, and again, this is my personal opinion, that can actually do more damage because they haven't been properly trained in that, so they think they're doing this coaching. Um, but a coaching really needs to be by a really properly trained professional in this space um, and that can actually you know be much more beneficial and um, sometimes people uh, on the other side people think from a coachy perspective that they're in a coaching process and they're quite negative about it you can only coach someone who's in a positive mindset or a positive space now that's for proper career coaching and effective coaching. If you're coaching someone for a performance issue, that's totally different. That's more performance management. What I'm talking about is more of that kind of executive coaching or career coaching, but you have to be in a positive space to be a recipient of that coaching. And then I have a question then from Emer. Um, when you talk about winning hearts and minds, is there any specific initiative organizations can work towards? So with winning hearts and minds, it comes down to your engagement um, policy and engagement processes as well. So winning hearts is all about that passion that people have. They're led by emotion. So what they need from this is they, it might be your CEO or someone from a very senior part of the organization coming down and giving that real passion talk about their mission, vision and values, not just for the sake of it on a piece of paper, but really living that every day. People who are led by the heart are very passion driven, really need to have a sense of purpose in the organization. So they have to have that connection with how their role fits in to the overall department, to the overall organization. If that link is missing, um, they won't have that passion to work hard and be there because that sense of purpose isn't there for them. People on the mind side are very logical and analytically driven. So they have to know analytically 
how their role fits into the overall organization strategy. So for me, this all starts with the organization strategy being drilled down to each person's job every day. Now, I wish I had a magic wand to translate that into an initiative, but that's where it starts. Okay, Fiona, thank you very much. We've run over a little bit over time, but that was fascinating insight and all squashed into 30 minutes. I know. Thank you, everyone, who signed on. And we, following this, we will send around the video of today's presentation. And we'll also send around emails for the next lunchtime bites. Fiona, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.